All right, everybody. So we're here. We've got kind of a new, I don't want to call it a format because that implies we're going to do this often. Maybe we will. Who knows? But we've got kind of a new show style for you with this episode. And today I'm joined by returning guest, uh, host of the Marshall Thoughts podcast, Sensei Jared Wilson. Hello. Thanks for being here, Sensei Wilson. And uh, new to the show, Sensei Robert Ingram, the founder of McDojo Life. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So Fans of the show, listeners of the show. I, I'm, I'm hoping if people are listening, that they're fans. But maybe, maybe there are people out there that listen just to heckle. Uh, maybe, maybe there are some Statler and Waldorf sorts on the other end of of these wires. But uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to have a conversation. And it, of course, it's the first time we've had two guests on the show. But today, we're going to talk about McDojo's uh, legitimacy of martial arts and really that whole bag that kind of gets opened up and and often with a lot of strong opinions. So we're going to have a chat. We're going to talk about all that. But first, let's let, let's start because it'll be probably a little bit shorter. I want to give Sensei Ingram a little bit more time. Uh, Sensei Wilson, just for any of the listeners who haven't had a chance to listen to your show or to the episode of, of Martial Arts Radio where you came on and we learned about you, just give us a, a little bit about who you are and your background uh sure uh well like you said i do uh martial thoughts podcast which is another martial arts uh podcast uh <laughs> it's kind of so aptly named <laughs> it's kind of funny how that works out yeah um martial arts wise uh i started back in 1995 and i started in uh, a form of a koru which is a, an old japanese school uh system uh at the time it was called yamagatoru bujutsu uh, I've done Aikido since then, Aikido and Kenjutsu, and in the last year or so, I've actually started doing some Penjak Slot. So martial arts-wise, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so you've got a diverse background, and, and I'm sure, of course, with all the people that you've spoken with, if it if it's changed your thought processes, anything like it has mine, you know, you're you're wide open to the arts. You know, there, there's there's value in the arts. There's value in all arts, and. Um, yeah, I, would, I've, would you agree? Uh, I've talked to people from. I'm, I'm trying to collect them all. You know, all the different arts I can. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like martial arts go. I guess you know. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've talked to people who have done African martial arts, which I didn't officially know there were anybody that was still practicing them. But nice. you know, it, it comes from all over. So there's always going to be at least, at the very least, cultural value in all martial arts. So awesome. I agree. All right, so Sensei Ingram, tell us a little bit about you and, and your martial arts background, but also about McDojo Life and uh, your goals for that brand, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Yeah, um, I uh, I started off when I was uh, 12 years old. I've been training for about 19 years now. Uh, April will mark 20 years. I'm excited. Two decades, yeah. Um, <laughs> I started off in karate. Uh, I started off because I got beat up in school. I got hospitalized for two days, and a friend of mine handed me a card, and it was like, you need this, <laughs> and it was uh, for karate. I was like, okay, so I started. Um, I have a third degree black belt in karate. It's American freestyle karate. Um, and then I started boxing, uh, full contact boxing when I was 15. Uh, then from there I went on to kickboxing. Then I did a uh, sport karate. Uh, I was on a national team with a uh, Waco and, uh, I also traveled with a uh, NASCA, uh, the NASCA circuit with a team full circle. And I did that for about two years. And now I am a purple belt in jujitsu and I'm working on my black belt belt in jiu-jitsu now i'm just trying to slowly but surely notch my way that way oh wow i didn't know you had the that waco connection and the the nasca competition connection we should compare notes there's some some friends of mine that i'm sure are, may not be friends of yours <laughs> at least not competitive friends <laughs> i don't maybe you never know man you never know and hey. it's, it's a small it's awesome. small world you know it is it is it's a lot of fun in that way all right so tell us how you started mcdojo life and why and and, you know, assume people listening don't know, don't know about what you're putting out for that content. Well, yeah, definitely. It's uh, started off as a dialogue between me and a friend of mine, and he had never heard of what a McDojo was. He had never heard the term. And for anybody who doesn't know, it typically refers to uh, the, the McDonald's theme of like how many burgers they pass out is how many black belts those schools pass out per a year or day or hour or whatever. Um, and it basically is a term that's derogatory towards a martial arts school. Um, and I had looked it up to try to show him what I meant, and there was nothing online that really described it well. 
Um, so I was like, well, maybe I'll take a stab at it. So I tried to start my own, um, try to get people aware of mostly schools that had to do with anything that was typically more illegal. Um, like, you know, if somebody was a pedophile, known pedophile who owned a school. If someone was a criminal who owned a school and that was their only means of income, if somebody, you know, blatantly was ripping people off, I liked people to know about that. And that, those were the kind of schools that I, I go after at first. And now we're trying to branch off and uh, make it a little bit more universal instead of just talking about McDojo's. And hopefully we'll be able to do more with it as time goes on. But we figured we'd start a dialogue with it and see, you know, what other people's thoughts were and ideas were with it. <laughs> Sure. And of course, if anyone's heard that term McDojo, you may have used it or heard it used in a little bit broader sense. Uh, I I think probably the easiest way to to think of it that some people use it to speak ill of any martial arts school that does anything they disagree with. (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So, uh, and of course, you know, that's kind of the heart, at least that's, that was the inspiration for this conversation was to talk about that, to talk about that term, to talk about the way your brand's using that term and everything else. So you gave us a few examples of the, what, of what you see a McDojo as. So tell us a little bit more. Tell us why you kind of started on that personal crusade. Well, you know, I, this is my job full time. You know, I'm a, I'm a full time instructor. And this is all I do. I don't have a side job. This is what I do. And this is my passion. It's something I've loved. I've been doing it for a while now. And I plan on doing for as long as my body will allow me or as long as I can physically do it, um, which is hopefully forever, you know. Um, but in that time, you know, you kind of see people who almost take advantage of the system. Like, for instance, there's a martial arts school. Uh, we talked about this before. I'll try not to name drop as much as I can help. Uh, but there's a martial arts school in uh, Georgia. And that particular martial arts school uh, had an instructor who was uh, accused by nine students of uh, molestation. And those students were past the statute of limitations on that. So even though they came forward and said this guy molested them, because they were past the statute of limitations, that gentleman still owns a school in Georgia right now today and still teaches kids. And one of his students did go to jail for molestation. So... Those kind of schools exist, and I think they shouldn't. I think if somebody like that is around and people don't know or are not aware of those things, I think people should have the right to know. I think I think there's a a, and for whatever reason, if you have like the news feeds like I do for Google news feeds or whatever, that seems to be about a third of the martial arts news that comes across is you know so and so dojo was accused of molesting kids and whatnot, And, and I think that's a an important thing that because we put so much trust in, in martial arts instructors with our kids, especially. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking it up now. We did an episode at, at some point, I'm trying to pull it up talking about that, talking about how as a martial arts school owner, and, and I was, I'm not anymore. There's a responsibility that's a little bit greater than the average person, the average uh, school owner, let's say, about you know representing the arts in a positive light. I mean, would, do you guys agree? Do you? No, I agree completely. I think that you know, you're. I think when you you take the responsibility of a school owner, you're also taking the responsibility of an ambassador for the martial arts, and uh, that's a big responsibility. You know, if we look at pretty much most nine times out of 10, most martial arts schools have a picture on the wall of somebody who they're representing, you know, and uh, you're carrying that torch. And basically what happens is when you go through and you decide to do something like that, not only are you smearing your name, but you're smearing that art's name, something that could be pure. And you're just tainting it with something that's just not and just incredibly wrong. And then next thing you know, people associate that name or that style or that art with you and you could ruin an entire art, something that could be, you know, who knows, hundreds of years old, if not older, and it could be gone because four or five people decided they're going to do something wrong with it. Right. And I found the episode. It was episode 69. We'll link to it in the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com if anyone's new. But the inspiration for that episode, Sensei Wilson, was exactly what you were commenting on that anytime you do a news search about martial arts, karate, taekwondo, 
a huge percentage of the articles that come back are about such and such school or school owner, instructor accused of something illegal, quite often some some um, kind of sexual assault perpetrated against a youth. Yeah, I think as uh, especially for school owners, it, it's not that you need to be like a paragon of virtue, but you do have a higher standard in the community of what you're supposed to be. And maybe that's, uh, you know, I don't know, Mr. Miyagi syndrome that, you know, what that's what we expect of the, the instructor, but that that's what the reality is. I mean, we, it, as opposed to say like a daycare system where they have to be licensed, you know, and martial arts instructors don't have to be. So, right. Right. And we've talked about that on the show too, that, you know, there's, there's certainly a downside to some kind of standardization, some kind of licensure for martial arts instruction, but, uh, Overall, it's probably best because, you know, as martial artists, we like to do our own thing and discover our own thing. But I think there's a a very important element here, uh, uh, a role that you're playing, Sensei Ingram, with exposing some of these schools. So let's say someone listening is is curious, you know, well, well, what about my school? Has my school been vetted, right? I mean, is yeah. that something you would ever consider getting into? Or um, who? Do, how does someone not make, so not make the cut? We've, uh, I've, I've discussed this about growing the brand. This has been something that's come up several times across the table. Uh, I have a few people that work with me and have been working with me about it growing. And uh, the, it, it, it's very difficult because if you think about it, the only real way to make that happen would to have actual students of those schools make those those cla- those calls those claws which would be like a uh, Yelp basically because you can go on Yelp and people who have been a part of a school already will make their assessment and put it on Yelp nine times out of ten it's people who are there currently who are happy who are sometimes have even been told hey go on there and give us a review um, but then you have like that one random angry person who's just angry for no reason so it's very difficult to weed through who's just angry at their situation, which nine times out of 10 could be like a contract they're not trying to fulfill or agree with when the business side. Um, But I think when it comes to the other side of it, you know, like if somebody lies, you need to have proof, you know, like you can't just go around saying that this person is a a con artist with no proof, you know, and I think that it's very important that people understand that, you know, if so-and-so decides to give out black belts like hotcakes, then I think that's important for people to know as well. It's like, you know, I think that there should be some kind of a, uh, almost like a system to where people can understand what they're looking for and find what they're looking for because not everybody is trying to be an MMA fighter. You know, some people want their black belt in two years and in that two years time, they may not work very hard for it, but maybe they'll get what they're looking for out of it. And I think we're all looking for something different in the arts. So to have a universal vetting system is impossible because we're all looking for something different. But maybe there should there could be a way for people to just know what a school is all about before they get in there. For instance, like maybe a marker on the average time it takes to get a black belt or a marker on how much the monthly cost is, which would be very difficult because a lot of business owners don't even talk about cost until you talk walk in the door. Um, is there an intro lesson? Is there not? Um, is there, uh, how many belts are there in the system? Uh, do you have to pay for a testing fee? Is there a contract? Is it month to month? I think it'd be nice if there was a system in place to show at least that up front so people can make their own assessments. Is there a, a one uniform that's required or can you buy, buy your own? You know, I think all that stuff, um, I saw a list of, uh, 20 different ways you know that there's a McDojo and one of like a few of them are just business ways to keep your school alive <laughs> like there might not necessarily be a McDojo because you all have to wear a white uniform you know there are plenty of great schools like Kyokushin karate schools where you got to wear a white uniform and you wear their uniform and but there it's amazing training uh so I think hence, hence the term uniform yeah you know like <laughs> I, I want my police officer to wear a hawaiian shirt no i don't i want him to wear a police officer shirt <laughs> exactly. you know, because i want to know he's a police officer you know how are you supposed to instill discipline in people when you let them walk up to your school with mustard stains all over their clothes and wearing hawaiian stuff but in any case my tangent <laughs> i think it's very hard to have a vetting system because everyone's looking for something different and everyone typically will gravitate towards what they're looking for. And some of that does have to do with those types of qualities that a lot of people don't like. Who Who is it for me to say that those people should not go there? I think people should be able to make up their own mind. I just don't think that people should be suckered or lied to into those situations. Um, 
and and that's certainly a fine line. And of course, the the metrics that you just gave out for any kind of let's call it a vetting system that that you know maybe you or someone would run with. And and just as a personal side, I would love to see that have some mass adoption if those metrics can be objective. Because uh, yeah. Uh, I would love to see everyone get to the martial arts school that they're going to do best at because then they're going to stay in the martial arts. They're going to receive the benefits of training. And as we've talked about on this show a number of times, what's Whistle Kick's business model? Get people in the martial arts, keep them there, and then we'll have more people to sell those yeah. stuff to. Yeah. Right? So pretty straightforward. Uh, Sensei Wilson, I know you've trained in a number of different schools. Do you think it's possible, these types of, of objective metrics? You know, Do you think we can even do that? Well, it it would almost have to be like uh like the Better Martial Arts Bureau, kind of like the best Better Business Bureau type of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it would have to be almost a matter of pride that somebody would want to put that up on their dojo, so that or dojang or whatever. But so that the people that don't have it, there's something wrong with that. So it almost makes it a positive reinforcement rather than a negative one. Um, if we could do something like that, and it's like you know, here probably show your I don't know certificate of office and office. Uh, authenticity if i can speak you know <laughs> and put that up on your wall and say look we're rated you know four out of five dojo stars whatever you want to call it um but i, I four out of five shuriken you know, four out of five ninja stars <laughs> um I, I think you made a good point when you're talking about the the con men too is that i think this mainly targets the new people in martial arts or you know the mothers and fathers that don't know any better for their kids definitely you know, it's not, you know, you or I or Jeremy who's been in here for a long time that is going to go to a dojo and just have that bad feeling of, nope, not going to do that one. This is mainly for just trying to, you know, milk people out of their money when they first get into the idea. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that uh, uh, we had a dialogue, me and Jeremy were talking the other day, and uh, we were talking about um, kind of how sometimes uh, martial artists may start off legit. And uh, mm. very similar to uh, almost like a dementia, <laughs> they just slowly start to become someone else um, and they start buying into themselves a little bit. And uh, then they want other people to buy in that as well. And it's almost like being a part of a uh, with a friend for like 20 years. You know, you're hanging out with them in middle school. And at first, y'all are cool. You know, you were hanging out and you and let's just say your friend is karate. So you and karate are hanging out. You first met karate. You were all about it. You're like, karate is great. I'm going to do karate forever. And me and karate are going to hang out and be pals. And then five years goes down the line and karate starts drinking a little bit. You're like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, karate. You're not, you might want to slow it down there, buddy. Karate's like, what are you talking about? We're cool. You're like, you're right. We're cool. You know, you're doing your own thing. And then karate starts getting into some heavy drug use. You're like, whoa, karate. What's wrong with you, man? And you stay with karate no matter what because you were buddies. Well, I think that happens a lot with martial artists who first start off as they join a gym. And at first, everything's on the up and up, and it seems fine. And then they slowly start to drink the Kool-Aid over time, and then they start to believe some of the things that they're taught that just couldn't possibly work. But they believe it anyway because they, gosh darn it, they're sticking with this art, and they're going to make it. And some. Sometimes they even have that black belt hung over them like, oh, well, if you want to make it to black belt, you got to believe in the bull. And you're like, well, I uh, kind of want to get my black belt, but I don't believe that, but I'll just go with it. And I think that happens to a lot of people. I think they feel stuck, you know, or the loyalty factor comes into play. And they just no matter what they're taught or no matter what they see or no matter what goes on in their school, they stick with it anyway because they've been taught loyalty and honor. And that's how you do it. And even if things aren't good for them personally, they'll just go along with it. And I think that's a lot of a, what a rut people kind of, kind of fall into, kind of like a trap. And then next thing you know, the school that they started off with just isn't the school it used to be. But they stay with it anyway, you know, and they perpetuate that cycle. It's certainly a fine line. You know, I think any martial arts school, at least any martial arts school worth attending, does teach loyalty and honor and respecting the instructors. I mean, those are critical elements that are instilled in, even in the, the youngest classes with the, the lowest ranks. But then when something is presented that isn't right, you know, whether it's a, a martial arts technique or sequence that you look at and say, I'm not really buying that. That does that just doesn't seem like it's going to work. Or, you know, outside the martial sphere, uh, a question of personal integrity. And I think we've all known 
plenty of people in and outside of the martial arts who have done things that just make them plain bad human beings. I mean, one of you said at the beginning that, you know, martial artists are people, right? And so they're, they're just as fallible as, as anybody else. But how do we handle that? How do we, how do we honor and respect our instructors, but pull them aside and say, um, you can't date that underage girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, let me back up for one second here because I, I think we're making a, a – we, we kind of veered off into a distinction here. Is we talk about one aspect of McDojo's, which are kind of the money-making aspect of it, and then we talked about another one that we're talking about with like the legitimacy of what they're teaching aspect. So those are, I guess, two different – Fast food joints of McDojo's? I don't know how you want to say that. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> um, so the lid, it's, it's the it's the restaurant. It's the the walk in the restaurant versus the drive. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the legitimacy one. Yeah, and I think you're right. Is it it can happen over time, um, and I think that's where you need to have senior students, kind of halfway in between people. If you're the, you know, the new orange belt who just been there for three months and you're like, yeah, this is feeling kind of creepy. But, you know, like you said, there's that loyalty factor. They keep telling me about I got to do something. Then you got to have an older student, a, an, an elder brother, so to speak, to go to and have them be the in-between person. I think that would be the, the at least the, the first step on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't see anything wrong with that. Definitely. Um the, the, I think the hardest part would be is uh, if there's like a cult like mentality where you don't go against what the instructor says, you know, and I, I've seen that a few times over the years. Um, and I think that it's important that we understand that our instructor is there and we're paying the money to learn a lesson. And it's a lesson that we might not necessarily understand yet, which I've trust me <laughs> over the years. I have definitely had some techniques thrown at me that I was like, no way. Uh uh-uh, uh, not gonna work. And then the instructor did it to me, and I was like, "Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I was I was completely wrong. This guy can do it." And you know, just like we were talking about before, about everybody has something different that they're looking for. Um, I think everybody has something different that they're looking for with technique as well, because what might work for one person, what might not necessarily be the bee's knees for someone else. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Um, when it comes to like. Most of the things that kind of easing to it, but I'll just go ahead and say it, like no touch knockouts and things like that. I think that when it comes to that kind of stuff, um, I think that most of the time, almost everyone in the room is on board or at least pretending to be on board Um, because there are plenty of definitely plenty of videos online where there's like 50 people in a room. And people are getting flown across the room with like the Jedi mind tricks and everybody's applauding. And, you know, at the very least, they're enabling the behavior if they don't believe it. You know, I think that makes it a little harder to go to somebody at that point and say, hey, is this guy for real? And you be like, well, no, not really, but just go with it because he's old. <laughs> <You know? laughs> sure. Well, I mean, the human psychology that allows some of that to happen is pretty interesting. It's, it's the same thing in some crazy martial arts schools. It would definitely fit your definition of a McDojo of my definition of a McDojo and a cult. Yeah. You know, people don't generally drink all the Kool-Aid the first minute they walk in the door. I mean, they're kind of let in and they're, you know, they're looking for something that they haven't found and, they feel like they belong and, and so on and so forth. But, of course, in the martial arts, we've got a slightly different element around self-defense. Most of us expect that if we reach the rank of black belt that we can probably not get murdered. <laughs> now, on, on that same note, i got to do a little bit of defense here for Aikido because, just because it's one of those that really seems to suffer from this a lot. And I... Uh, <laughs> And again, I'm not trying to justify anything, but uh, Aikido's terrible. It doesn't work. <laughs> You're right, exactly. Everything you did when you came up to our event in July, when, when you threw me around, I was completely faking it. Um, exactly. Just trying to make you look good. Well, see, that's part of the thing is, if you go back and watch the old videos, and we're going to talk about Osensei, um, when he was doing his Aikido back in the 50s, the people were kind of flopping around, and it looked really bad because. They knew that if they didn't move, he was going to beat their head in. I mean, he was literally – he was doing like a clothesline and he was going to take off their head. So they anticipated that and actually kind of fell down ahead of time. 
but it was because they knew what was coming next. When he got older, it was kind of, uh, well, you know, Sensei is an old man now, can I just go with it? You know, <laughs> that type of a thing. So I think that's like step two of getting to the no touch knockouts. <laughs> so I can see where there's a progression on that one. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like with uh with every art, I think how I how just over the years, how I see different martial arts has developed and changed and kind of where I'm at in my stage of life right now is how I see different martial arts is based off of what they feel will work best overall to protect themselves. And uh, some arts aren't about that at all, which I find very interesting because some people don't want to spar. Um, that's not their thing, but they would still like to learn how to protect themselves, which is, you know, it, it's kind of like a double edged sword there. It's very difficult to really learn to protect yourself without kind of putting yourself in certain situations uh, to put yourself to have the ability to lose almost. Um, and I think that, you know, with a keto, just from what I've seen with a keto, it seems like there are a lot. It's real heavy on wrist locks. Is that correct? Yeah. Um... And again, because uh, we're picking on Aikido and I get to be the defender of it. <laughs> um, there's a lot, again, if you go back, to, there's kind of like a, a division line with Aikido as uh, pre-war Aikido and post-war Aikido. Mm -hmm. And and the pre-war seems to be much more of a real martial art. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like Osensei is famous for saying, you know, uh, Aikido is 75% striking, mm -hmm. which you don't see that much anymore because as he got older, he kind of became, I don't know, much more fluid with it. He didn't have to do that. They were, they hit, the strikes were hidden. But even then, in, you know, in the, the literature, you talk about some of the old guys would say, okay, now Sensei would take us into the back room and go, now here's how you really do Aikido. You know, this is stuff we're showing everybody. This is where the strikes are. And they all came out going, we can't do that. We would break people. <laughs> so, you know, yes, you're right. A lot of it is kind of the, I don't want to say unrealistic, but yeah, like I said, the small well, joint manipulation, the risk. Well, I think that I think that there's a time and place for that. Like, uh, right, right, right. I think that just like any art, you know, like, uh, like for instance, if I put a Taekwondo guy, um, he's a third degree black belt in Taekwondo, amazing kicks, you know, can kick your face off. Um, foot detaches, flies to the air, kills five people. Um, <laughs> and then you put him in a boxing match, you know, hmm. well, that's a different thing. You know, that, that's a different range. That's a different art. That's a different sport. Um, so he would be out of his element. Well, it's the same thing with uh, Aikido. Like, for instance, there's a guy up at our school right now, and he's a black belt in Aikido. He owns an Aikido school here in Jacksonville, and uh, he, he's a blue belt in jiu-jitsu now. And I got on his back, and he got me in a wrist lock and tapped me out quick, and, <laughs> you know, because there's a time and a place for it. And how sometimes it's presented isn't mm -hmm. necessarily the art, um, if that makes any sense. Like um, Fumio Demora used to do these amazingly outlandish, over-the-top karate demonstrations because they were cool looking. Not because he was showing off the art very much, but because he wanted attention. And if he got attention, people would join his school. And that's kind of how he got more people to join him and to grow his art, which was genius. Um, but not everything that he showed was necessarily something that was going to work verbatim. It was just kind of a demo. It was like, hey, look at this. This is cool looking. Um, and I think that that's important to have in arts, too, you know, because if your art looks boring as hell, no one's going to ever want to do it, <laughs> you know. So I think that that stuff's important to have in your art is a little bit of flash and a little bit of flair. But I think the hard line needs to be drawn and people need to know this is kind of the showing off stuff. This is the real stuff. Don't do this to protect yourself. Do this instead. You know, like if I uh, was doing karate and they were like the only thing I ever learned in karate, if the only thing I ever learned was I went into my first class and they were like, break this board. I was like, okay. And then I got mugged the next day and I was like, crap, what do I do? Wait a minute. I learned this in class and I pull out a board and I break it and then I get mugged, you know? Well, it's because that's, that's a small part. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I think that it's important that people can differentiate between something that's real and something that's just kind of for show. So if someone's listening and maybe they're new to the martial arts or maybe they've been training forever and they're wondering if they've drank too much Kool-Aid <laughs> and, and they don't, they don't have an objective opinion anymore. How would you tell someone to, to judge, or let me say it a different way. What rules, what 
cues could you give someone to help them identify if a particular martial arts school is a McDojo on the level that you're talking about here? <laughs> um, wow. Fairly difficult question. Um, I think there's a, and again, I'm going to bring up Aikido because that's a lot of my experience, but one of the bad things about Aikido training is there's way too much compliance until you get up to a certain level. So you really don't have a good idea how and when the techniques work. So if there's an over-reliance on compliance, um, you know, if, if they go, you know, if you're doing the technique and you say, well, it didn't work. And they say, well, that's because he didn't go with you. Well, no, that means that the technique didn't work. It didn't mean anything about the other person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and there, you know, there are certain things like that. I think every art has something like that, like in jujitsu, you know, mm -hmm. we might not necessarily go with the technique, but we tap. Well, like you didn't break my arm. Well, I wasn't supposed to break your arm. You were supposed to tap. <laughs> like, am I supposed to break your arm every time we practice? Like, no, you know, there's a line drawn or like boxing. You know, when you didn't knock me out, what was I supposed to? <laughs> you know, I hit you. If I hit you harder, you fall over. Um, but, you know, when it comes to like rules or guidelines, I think that that belongs to per the person's gut instinct. You know, I think if people are happy where they are, they should just continue to train where they train. You know, who cares what other people think? It's your art and your style. And if you like it, it's keeping you out of trouble. If you're a, t a troubled kid, if it's teaching you some type of self-discipline, if you're having a rough or if it's giving you a place to escape to, if you're getting <clears throat> abused at home, I say go to it and nurture it and stay with it as long as you can. If it's being a positive influence in your life. But I think that you should also be aware of your gut instinct when it comes to what's real and what's not. For instance, I'll even go to the other spectrum. Let's say you go into an MMA school and uh, all they do is MMA. And the guy has an amazing record. He's like 42 and 0, you know, amateur, professional. He's got kickboxing matches all around the world. And you go in and all they do is beat you up. Then you're in a big dojo. You are not in a school that's going to be conducive to you learning. You're a dummy and you're getting beat up now and not a dummy in the sense of being dumb. You're literally a punching bag. You're a tackling and, dummy. Yeah, that's not so that's not safe and that's not going to help you learn anything. So I think people need to listen to their gut instinct. If you're just not happy where you are, leave, you know, and in jujitsu, they have this term called creonche. Have you ever heard of that? No, it's a it's a jujitsu term for traitor. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, and it's based off of a, a soap opera. There was a traitor in a soap opera. He was like real over the top, like Spanish soap opera. And uh, his name was Creonche. And uh, basically, he just kind of like was kind of stabbing everybody in the back all at once. Well, in jiu-jitsu, if you trade to another jiu-jitsu school, you're typically known as a Creonche. And uh, that's a bad term. I say if you traded your school, either you're doing something that's bettering yourself you shouldn't worry about what other people have to say about you. You know, if you're not comfortable where you are, that's not your fault. That is your instructor's fault. You know, if they're not providing you with the services that you're paying for as a customer, then leave. You know, and it's all about gut instinct. If you're not happy, simply go. But I think that don't stay because you're getting fed a line about loyalty. If that's all you hear all the time is loyal, 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 don't leave. Or you always hear about every other school being told that it's so bad. That's a problem as well. If everybody tells you their art's the best all the time, maybe they're trying to compensate a little bit. Mm. So I'm trying to pin you down. I'm trying to get you to, to, to give us some, some examples because I think that those are fun to talk about and and – you know, there may be some people listening and say, really, this kind of stuff happens. So I'll, I'll give you an example of one. I know of a martial arts school where even if you leave, you have to keep paying the instructor. <laughs> OK, well, <laughs> so a contract, basically. Mm, no, no. And there, there's a there's a whole other bunch of stuff there. But oh, okay. um, so it's, yeah, it's not it's not a contract is, thing it has to do with is it the art um, itself. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if if there are schools like that, I've heard of, like um, you have to pay uh, like annual ah. instructor fees to continue to teach that art. I've heard of that before. And if you don't pay those fees, then you're no longer certified to be able to teach the art. And if you're 
not certified, then you're not going to pop up on their website, which is going to show you as not legit. Um, right. And I think that that's kind of jacked up. <laughs> you know, I think you should try to keep up with your art. But, you know, if I was already taught the art and I can continue to practice the art, then how did I magically forget the art? <laughs> you know, like I didn't forget it just because I'm not learning it from you. <laughs> um, obviously, there's always room to grow. I think that uh, if you're looking for specifics, um, here's just some off the top of my head. Um if you uh, go into your martial arts school, your studio, and uh, you see plaques all over the wall, and you see these plaques, and they're for, like, these multiple world organizations. We're talking, like, 70 or 80 world organizations. I've known <laughs> some that were, like, 15 or 16 plaques on the wall of, like, different organizations. And you look them up online, and this person is the head of all those organizations. Something's wrong. They probably made them up. <laughs> um why do you need that many organizations? <laughs> um, you know, if they have uh, usually uh, more than like, I'd say, seven black belts, something's probably wrong. Um, like if you look at somebody like Michael Jai White, that dude's a great martial artist. I met him in person. He's one of Bill Wallace's guys as well. You know, he's he's a martial artist and he's got several black belts. I want to think like seven or eight. Right. Um but he's not one of those dudes that's like posting those placards on his wall all the time. He's not like convincing you to buy his product because of that. Um, and I think that when you're getting sold something over and over and over again, something's wrong. Um, um, you know, if the instructor brings you in for the first day and your very first day you spar, something may be wrong unless you're in a boxing school or kickboxing school. And even then you probably should do mitt work and bad work first. Um, what else? Let's see here. If see, I, th I think of, I think of McDojo as being more money based from the instructor's point of view. And you that know, could be it too. Yeah. If you're if you're promised, you know, I because there is a legitimate way to do this. But if there's a black belt club, you know, pay the extra two hundred dollars and you can join the black belt club. That's yeah. that's a that's an iffy one. That should be sounding alarms. Definitely, that's a, that's a huge problem. I agree with that hundred percent. Um. So because that's going to be a, you know, a divisive thing, uh, point, depending on which side of that line you're on, Sensei Wilson, what, what are, would be a quick example of the right way to implement a black belt club and a wrong way? Well, there can be, mind. there can be advanced classes, right? But those are going to be designed for the people that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, it's like, you're not ready for that lesson yet. Well, at some point, you are ready for those lessons. You know, if you are the black belt and they're teaching the more advanced lessons, that can be a separate class, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, if you give us an extra $50 a month, we'll ensure in a year you'll get to the black belt club. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that has nothing to do with my ability. That has to do with how much I'm paying you. That should be a clue. Would it be safe to say, would, would both of you agree that if anything is promised based on a certain financial commitment, it's probably a McDojo. Uh, like yeah, that, that should be sounding off those warning yeah. bells. Yeah, that's huge. Um, your money should not buy your belt, you know. But it's it, it's it's like uh, I'm going to go really sexist here real fast. I'm going to be super sexist and uh, I'm going <laughs> to just kind of use it as an example, right? You, you're not supposed to buy your black belt, right? Um but you're also not supposed to buy the company of another woman. <laughs> so if you aren't supposed to be buying your date, but you take her out for a dinner, you take her out for a movie, you take her out for several dates, and you spend over $300, that courting time did cost you money. Well, it's the same thing with your black belt. It should cost you a little bit of money because you need to pay your dues somehow, right? So you're going to be paying somehow, but you shouldn't be awarded something just because you pay. You know, if you never show up and every you show up once a month and every time you show up, they're giving you a new belt and asking you for another testing fee. There's something wrong there. You know, you should you should feel comfortable with your skill level as you move up. If you feel like you were just handed something, then you need to either say something to an instructor, which can come off kind of pompous sometimes. But you need to speak your mind. You know, if you get handed a belt and you're like, dude, I have been here for like two months and they go you're ready like ready for what i really don't know what i'm doing um you know then something's wrong and i and even over the years i've had students come to me because of things like that you know they were like well they're, they're just asking for my money like well yeah they're a business <laughs> but you know if they're just asking for your money and you're getting promoted because of it there's something wrong
And I think that's a perfect example that you gave. Maybe not the uh, most <laughs> apropos kind. Uh, I think it's very apropos, but maybe not the the most G-rated <laughs> analogy. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that is a subject that uh, is often spoken of. <clears throat> at at no point in any romantic relationship is anything promised or guaranteed, and. It sounds like you're saying that there should be no guarantees or promises of any rank advancement based on time or money. It should be based on skill, which is hard to development. You know, right? that I, I think I'm becoming more cynical the older I get about it because that's <laughs> difficult to gauge, too, because you can't gauge everyone the same way. You know, I can't put a guy with no arms in a boxing ring and I say, all right, hit the speed bag. Um, it's not going to work. <laughs> so how do I judge him against someone else? You know, how do you judge that? And I think the only way to judge someone in their art is can they beat who they were yesterday? And even if it isn't physically, are they better than who they were when they first started the art? And I think that is the only way to gauge your students is based off of when they started and how they as an in individual are growing in your art. And even if it's not in your art, for instance, I have a, an example. We have a guy up at our school and he was about 50 pounds overweight and he had a girl at his office that he wanted to ask out on a date. And the only reason that he started at the martial arts studio was because he wanted to ask her out on a date. He wanted to lose the weight to do so. And he didn't want to go to the gym because he knew he wouldn't do it. So he wanted something fun. So he joined the jiu-jitsu program. He lost that weight. And I'm not making it up. He lost the weight. He asked her out on a date. Now they are married with two kids. That dude is, <laughs> you know, is he the he, best? He gets at, a black belt in something. You know, <laughs> you know, exactly. He's not the best at jiu-jitsu, but it touched his life to make him a better person. You know, it changed him. And I think that that can't be just taken for granted. You know, so what? He can't, like, he's not a black belt yet. So what? It's doing something good and positive in his life. So if I was going to put this dude on a video, you know, maybe you would be like, oh, well, he doesn't deserve that belt or whatever. Well, judge based on who? It shouldn't be based on you. It should be based on him and where he was. And he's getting better. And I think that that's what's important. And I think that it's really hard to put markers on stuff because you base shouldn't be basing it on everyone. You should be basing it on individuals and how they are doing. That's just my opinion on that. And my instructor had an interesting view on that too. Um, I, as part of a review board, I got to you know help promote people, and I actually said to him one time, I said that person their their skill level isn't where it needs to be to be uh, whatever it was a blue belt. And he looked at me and said, "Yeah, but they'll grow into it. It's like buying shoes. You buy a little bit bigger so you can grow into it." And that was his idea on that one, and I kind of always kept that in my head. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good thought too. You know, some people step up to the challenge that you pre present them. You know, right. I think that's good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. So I think one of the questions that I have listening to what you two are saying and, and just, you know, this whole conversation and, you know, I've had this conversation by myself and, and with other people before. What is the role of an instructor? What's a martial arts instructor's job? And, and of course, you both are instructors. And so who better to ask? Well, well, ideally, like, uh, again, to bring up the movie, I mean, in everyone's eyes, you're Mr. Miyagi. You're their their life coach, their martial arts instructor, their you know substitute father, whatever it is. I mean, you, you're supposed to be filling all of these roles. Um, but like we said, we're human and it doesn't always quite work out that way. Yeah. OK, so, yeah, yeah go um, ahead. Sensei. I agree with that 100 uh, percent. I think that. I think that we are almost almost forced into a role that we're not qualified for, um, mm. if that makes any sense. We're qualified to be martial arts instructors, um, I would hope, <laughs> you know, depending on who you're going to. Um, we're not qualified therapists. We're not qualified mechanics. I'm not. Maybe you are. <laughs> maybe you have a side job. I'm not a certified roofer or contractor. You know, I think that a lot of instructors are kind of put in those positions. The only time that I see that that doesn't happen as much is like in a uh, more of a, a franchise type school. You don't really see that as much because it's a 
little bit more tight knit regiment because it's a little bit more based on money. Um, you know, it's like, all right, class is over. You guys leave next class Class is over. You guys leave next class. All right, we're closed. You have to leave. And there's a disconnect there with, uh, with most schools though, it's usually because the guy or girl, whoever happens to own the school loves their job and loves talking to people and loves talking shop and teaching the art. And then of course, as a byproduct, you find out more about your students and sometimes that helps teach them in the art. Sometimes it, you know, gives you a reference point. And sometimes it's a little too much, um, you know, uh, sometimes you almost overstep bounds um, and ask a lot of an instructor. And you have to remember, like we talked about before, before, your instructor is an instructor. I don't go to my barber and say, hey, man, you know, I'm trying to do some construction work on my house. What do you think is the best thing for me to do? Because he's a barber. I don't do the same thing with my mechanic. I don't go to my mechanic and say, hey, man, can you give me a quick haircut? Because he's a mechanic. You know, so I think people put martial arts instructors on a pedestal where they shouldn't belong. That's just the truth. Um, and that's a part of that stigma of kind of falling in a trap of staying with a school when you don't feel comfortable. Because sometimes you've opened your life up to this person and then you feel obligated to kind of stay there longer when you have to understand it's a business and it's a job. And yes, there's more to it than that. But sometimes there shouldn't be, you know, um, I think that it's a great thing when an instructor tries to go above and beyond. But sometimes that's just not their job. You know, I think it oversteps bounds sometimes. But at the same where do you uh, go ahead? I was going to say, but at the same time, you know, we we espouse the secondary benefits of martial arts. The Like we said, the loyalty, whatever, courteousness, all this other thing. So in some ways, the martial arts instructor is supposed to exemplify those ideas, too. Not that they can't fail, but they they should be exemplifying them. So I guess people take that and, and assume it's a bigger role than it really is. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's especially like let's say you're teaching children, you know, because children are they're going to say hey, whatever comes in their mind, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> kids say the best stuff on the map, um, sometimes the worst stuff. But kids are funny. Um, but they look usually at the instructor a hair different than an adult would, you know, sometimes an adult just comes into the school because they just want to learn martial arts. They, they might not necessarily want, um, for a better word, lack of better words, the lecture, you know, they might not want the spirituality of it. They might not want the moral behind it. They may just simply want to learn the technique, um, and me, uh, uh, vice versa. Sometimes people aren't there to become better at technique. Sometimes people are better are coming there to get more out of it because they need that part in their life. They need somebody to guide them. They need somebody to tell them something to help them. And they trust somebody who can kick the living crap out of them. It's a very <laughs> odd dynamic. You know, for some reason, we just always seem to trust a guy who can beat us up because they choose not to on a daily basis. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, he didn't beat me up today. So that's awesome. So he he could kill me, but he just chooses not to. So he must have a good moral compass. Um, and I think that that's where pe most people kind of fall into that is, you know, they go, well, I'm comfortable with this person because they can physically harm me, but they choose not to. So we're already starting off on a good foot. Um I just think that sometimes it does, you know, you have to draw the line somewhere as a human being and you just have to understand this is a person. They go out to a bar sometimes. They probably drink, you know, they probably um, have done something terrible in their life somewhere along the line. They may have messed up. And when you find out about that stuff, it shouldn't crumble your world. You know, you should just go, well, they're human. <laughs> they make mistakes. But a lot of people, they fall apart when they find that stuff out. They can't take it. How does an instructor, a school owner, keep their school from becoming a McDojo? You talked earlier about that it often is a slide. It's not just instantaneous. So what kind of stop gaps have you put in? You know, what kind of checks and balances do you have on yourself? I think the, the number one thing the instructor has to ask is, does this benefit the student? Right. If, if even if it's keeping the dojo open, you know, raising fees or belt fees or whatever it is, is to keep the dojo open, make sure, you know, the instructor has enough to survive so they can actually, you know, keep the dojo open, then that can be a justified reason for helping the student. But that, I think that's the first question. The first and last question is, is this for the student or is this for me? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think that's a good standard to hold, you know? Um, 
sometimes you can help the student and close your shop. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I think helping the students would be give it to them for free. <laughs> um, right. But it doesn't always work that way, um, you know, but I do agree. I do see what you are saying with that. I think that that is important. You need to make sure that your students are an important part of your business plan. How are they growing? How are you going to develop them? How are you going to make them better individuals, whether it be through the art, spirituality, or even morally? You know, I think that that stuff's important. Um, I think when it comes to the business side of it, I think that you need to understand that just through my personal experience, and I could be wrong, I found only three types of instructors in this world. I've only found three um, up to this point. Maybe I'll find more. There's the person who is very, 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 very good at business, but is terrible at martial arts, but they love it. There is somebody who's great at martial arts as an individual, terrible businessman. And then there's somebody who's not bad at martial arts, okay at business and they stay up open for a long time i have rarely found somebody who is just an incredible martial artist and an incredible businessman and a great human being you know you don't usually find all three um usually you get one or the other at most schools and uh i think that you need to stick to the one that you are good at and you need to try to improve at the one that you're not and that'd be an interesting survey to do in college to find out you know martial artists, what majors do they take? I bet you're right. I bet you there's very few business majors. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't require, we talked about that before, it doesn't require a certificate. You don't need a degree. Um, so a lot of schools are opened up by people who really have no real business in a sense. Um, they just go, I love karate. Let's do it. <laughs> you go, well, have you thought about like a five-year business plan? You know, have you thought about how much you're going to charge your students, what your overhead is going to be, and they have no clue. You know, that's why you see so many schools, like I personally see in Jacksonville, schools open and close within a couple months. Um, we've had one location that has had five different schools open up inside that same location, all martial arts schools, <laughs> all different names, and they've all closed within six months of each other. Wow. Now, personally, I would want to know why. <laughs> if I was going to open up a school there before I opened up the school, I'd look at the demographics of the area and go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Personally, something that I've already done with this school and go, wait a minute. There's no residential area within five miles of here. <laughs> go, well, maybe it's because people don't want to drive to you. And it's, what's a shame was it was a beautiful school. But whoever ran it had absolutely no business. It was obvious. And it, I'm, I'm sure they were great martial artists. I don't know. I never really trained there. But – you know, you usually get one or the other, and I think that the, the goal is to stick to the thing that you're good at and to improve at the thing that you're not. And don't try to fake it. Really learn about it. If you suck at martial arts, don't try to fake it and lie to people and say, I'm the greatest. I opened up my own. I belong to 18 different Hall of Fames. It's okay to suck. It's okay to be bad at it. People aren't there staying with you because you're the greatest in the world because none of us are. They're staying with you because they like you. They like what you're providing them, and they like the art. Now, whether you're the best at it or not, most people don't care. <laughs> but what they do care about is are you lying to them? Are you being upfront with them? Are you being fair with them? And then they'll stay with you because they like you. You know? And, and not every – Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, um, on the other hand, if you're a great martial artist but you're a terrible instructor, you're sliding down a slippery slope, and it's going to slowly equal no students. Because usually that means you're focusing too much on your own training and not enough on helping other people. And you need to focus on how you're going to keep your business alive to make sure that your students stay in the door, to make sure that you can keep keep teaching them the art that you're good at. You know, you got to develop that. You know, just as a, a quick aside for that, I had to go over and get it from my bookshelf. But there's a book called uh, here, Starting and Running Your Own Martial Arts School by Karen Vactor and Susan Lynn Peterson. So it actually goes through and kind of tells you how to look at some of those business ideas we were just talking about, just to plug someone's book for them. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important to make the distinction between someone's skill as a martial artist and someone's skill as a martial arts instructor, because I've known plenty that are one and not the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a shame. You know, somebody could be fantastic as an individual and just be not good with people. <laughs> um, like, for instance, like, uh, you know, and you can't really fault some people because that's just their personality, but maybe that's just not the job or the business they should go into. 
there are plenty of other jobs that they can do in the martial arts industry that don't involve them being a teacher. Um, you know, if you're great at it, that's good. Pursue it. If you love it, pursue it. But know your fault. Know that you're not good as an instructor. Understand that. Try to improve it. And if you can't, you need to go to a different avenue. Like all maybe making the world's up. best sparring here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you yes, know, I like know. a lot of people, uh, a lot of the people that I grew up with through the NASCAR circuit, they just became movie stars. <laughs> Go that route. <laughs> like yeah. uh, Taylor Lautner or Caitlin Deschel mm-hmm. or Matt Emig, you know, they weren't great fighters. That's the truth. They were not fighters. That's not what they did well. But what but they, they did do well was it. they were showmen. Yes, they were good sh- showmen. So what did they do? They pursued that. If they were to try to step into a ring, they would get destroyed. But they don't have to prove that because they have piles and piles of money now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's been a good conversation. But I, I want to, as we start to wind down here, let's talk about some of the most ridiculous things that you've seen through McDojo life. Be it, you know, I mean, we talked about the, <laughs> the pedophilic instructors and and, and the, the criminals, but. You know, what are what are some of the crazy things you've seen um, that I have got stuff for days? If you just go on the website, you can you can catch us on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, pretty much any social media that exists. We're on it. Um, we only post once a day. Um, and that's not only to kind of keep content down, but not to be annoying, because I hate when people post on their stuff like 50 times a day. Um, but when we post, it's typically funny stuff. I've seen uh, some of my favorite clips. One is a guy who was playing a guitar. And he is breaking bricks that are on fire while he's playing the guitar. <laughs> it is pretty outlandish. With, with the guitar yes, or no, with, his... with his hand. So he, every time he hits a chord, he breaks a brick. It is, <laughs> That's a power chord. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> stuff. And it's, it's, just, sorry, it's I entertaining. It. I laugh so hard at it. There's another one. Uh, there's a group called uh, Children of Poseidon. And they're kind of like a, a uh, an MTV type group i won't say the name because we're trying to keep it clean but you know the show um do stupid stuff on on television um but anyway so they uh they have a uh, thing that i just posted not too long ago and it's a cactus and this kid tries a karate chop through a cactus <sighs> needless to say he does not win or break the cactus but the cactus does win <laughs> um people will do dumb stuff to be on uh just to get famous um what else? Uh, what else have I seen? Oh, uh, there's a couple of good ones where instructors will prank um, other schools. So what they'll do is they'll go into a school and pretend to be a white belt. And of course, the head instructor is in on it. He knows whoever it is. And they'll pretend to be a white belt and they'll just throw them into like a sparring mix. And uh, it, it's just hilarious how people will treat a black belt differently than they treat a white belt. Um, you know, like they almost talk down to them. <laughs> like real condescending tones. And then like when they find out the guy's a black belt or as they start sparring, you can kind of see the light bulb come on their head. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> he does know what he's doing. He's lying to me. Um, then they'll, uh, they'll start treating them differently. It's pretty, it's pretty hilarious stuff, but that's, that's some of the crazier stuff I've seen. Uh, the stuff that sticks out in my mind. Sensei Wilson, you got it. You got any of those you want to throw at us? <sighs> um, I've seen different markers that will indicate that. Uh, my favorite one I ever saw, it was a, a camouflage belt. <laughs> I, I don't know. Where did that fit in, <laughs> in the rankings? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe that's when you get, you know, that black belt gets so confused it doesn't know what it is. I, I don't know what that one was. Maybe it was a ninja school and that, that was the camouflage part of it. I don't ahead, know. I'm going to go ahead and plug this guy too since you said that. There's a guy <laughs> who uh, does some pretty funny videos. And he is, uh, man, come on. It's redneck jujitsu. <laughs> and he wears a camouflage belt. And he, uh, it's pretty funny because he teaches jujitsu techniques, but almost in a, uh, a standoff fish kind of redneck type of way. Almost like somebody who only looked on YouTube once and was like, I know jujitsu. And then just teaches techniques like that he's just making up at the time. And it's pretty funny stuff. And his like saying is, if you're not, if brute strength doesn't work, you're not using enough brute strength. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a pretty funny guy. He's pretty good, like Master Ken type humor. <laughs> is is he in on the joke though, or is he oh, the joke? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's okay, definitely okay. a joke. He's not being serious. He's a legit okay. like jujitsu guy, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I thought it was pretty funny, like a good take on it. Like he does the something in jujitsu. There's something called a barambolo. I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm-hmm. um, but it's basically going inverted, kind of going upside down. Mm-hmm. And uh, he does something called the barambolo, where he does the same thing, but he does it with a Budweiser. And he's like upside down trying to drink this beer while he's trying to do the technique. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was pretty funny. Pretty good stuff to watch. I love it. That's great. So let's wrap it up here. And so Sensei Wilson, if someone wants to check out your show, Marshall Thoughts, you know, how, how can they find more out, out about your show or about you? Well, um, iTunes is where to get the show the easiest, but I think I'm on Stitcher and a couple of other ones too, if you don't like iTunes, but everyone seems to use iTunes. So I go with that. Uh, or if you want to look at the, the, the blog and the show notes and, you know, book reviews and stuff I do, it's at thinkingmarshall.blogspot.com. Uh, just because apparently marshallthoughts.blogspot.com was taken by someone. So <laughs> I had to go to the, ah. so whatever I could find. I was pretty close to that. So those are the two was- ways that I can, you can do that. Um, and my email and everything's on there. If anyone wants to talk to me or, you know, gripe about something I said on here, go for it. <laughs> great <laughs> or of course episode 76 of martial arts radio that was the show that you appeared on okay so great and sensei ingram uh what's next for mcdojo life um you know you mentioned the social media but give it to us again and, and any other ways people might be able to get a hold of you and what you're doing yeah um i think our next uh our next position we're going to go to is uh start posting some original content and up to this point we've kind of stayed away from it except for you know, um, our McDojos of the month that we were doing there for a while. Um, but I'd like to try to get into our some o- our own original kind of some funny, campy, humorous stuff that we can post. Um, and then we're going to do some live stuff. Uh, one of our things that we're going to be doing soon live is uh, uh, something we're calling Disqualified. And uh, we're going to try to find funny different ways that we can get disqualified from different martial arts tournaments. Uh, <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing, you know, outlandish, but hopefully something funny. Um, because I've read our, uh, I've read rule books front and back for pretty much every tournament I've ever complete and I've competed in. And, uh, there are some great ways to get disqualified that I've always thought about over the years. And I think it'd be good to catch on film. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also going to be hopefully opening up a website here soon. Um, and then when we get our website going, we're going to try to keep uh, continuity. So we're going to try to get all of the different funny martial arts videos that we find across the internet and put them all in one spot. So if you're looking for something funny, go there. And then, of course, we'll expand from there. And you can catch us at uh, pretty much uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, McDojo Life is all you got to look up. And uh, that's about it. Great. And, of course, you know, as we're recording this, it's early September 2016. But if you're listening to that much in the future, that website may exist. So, by all means, uh, once you've got that up and running, let us know. We'll update the show notes. And I did buy that website. So, it will be McDojoLife.com mcdojolife.com perfect awesome awesome well um we generally close with some advice but let's flip that around a little bit this hasn't really been an invite uh an advice uh, a deep introspective <laughs> into either of you um but how about a, a a funny quote or or something ridiculous that you've seen in your training that we can close it out with okay um I have a story. I've been meaning to tell this story on a podcast, but I haven't been able to yet. So Perfect. I'll just tell this. Love uh, it. Uh, so I used to compete in boxing uh, when I was about 16 years old. Um, I started when I was 15, and I went until I think I was about 17. Anyway, I was young. And uh, the, the boxing that I used to compete in was kind of not really sanctioned. Um, the The... <laughs> Well, okay, it was not sanctioned at all. It was a club fight, and we used to fight inside a club, and it was called Plush here in Jacksonville. And we used to have something called Friday Night Fights, and we'd have Super Slam Sundays. And this happened to be one of the Super Slam Sundays. And uh, we didn't have two fighters' rooms. We only had one fighters' area, and it was really small and cramped. So basically all the fighters had to get crammed into one room and wait there while they're waiting for a fight. So you're like (laughs) within arm's length of the other fighter. Um, because it was not sanctioned, the doctor was always drunk. That was great. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there was no regulation on smoking. So everybody in there was smoking like a chimney. Uh, pe- people would put their, uh, alcohol glasses on the, the ring, on the ring while you're sparring or while you're fighting. So sometimes you'd step back into somebody's cognac 
it would be that bad. <laughs> Um, so one time I was sitting there and there was an old guy and his name was grandpa. And I think he was like in his late fifties. They called him grandpa cause he was just the oldest guy fighting there. That was his nickname. And me and him were sitting on a couch and I'm all wrist wrapped up and I was waiting for my fight and, uh, we're having a conversation and I get called up to the bullpen, which is where we needed to wait for our fight. We need to get our gloves on and be prepared to get into the ring. So I go into the ring, um, and I fight. And I come back and I sit back down right in the same spot where he where I was sitting before. And I continue my conversation with him. And about halfway through the conversation, I ask him, when do I fight? <laughs> and uh, he goes, what? I said, when am I up? I'm, I've been waiting here forever. And he goes, are you serious? I go, yeah. What do you mean? He goes, you already fought. <laughs> I go, really? <laughs> he goes, yes. He goes, are you feeling OK? I guess like, yes, not. And apparently somewhere in there, I had received a very serious concussion, and I forgot about the fight. So the only thing I asked him, I looked him dead in the eye, and I said, um, did I win? <laughs> he goes, yeah. I said, okay, well, that's all that matters. <laughs> and to this day, I do not remember that fight. <laughs> Have you seen videos of it, though? I, I, there is a video. Maybe Wally will find one for me. He owns Black and Blue Video Productions, and they used to record all of them. And it was crazy, the fights that they had they had Thunderdome rules, which was no time limit. So they used to let guys just fight until somebody quit or got knocked out. They had three on three fights, two on two fights. Um, it was it would it, sometimes there'd be one on two fights. It was it was a pretty crazy time to be boxing. It would be entertaining to see these videos. So hopefully we can we can get one or two of them oh, and, I'll, and link I'll them up in the link. show notes. I'll send you a link. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's one of the best stories we've ever had on the show. Uh, Sensei Wilson, I'm sorry, but you get to follow that. Yeah, I don't think I anything that top that, but uh, you know, just because we'll go with the injury theme. You know, we were talking about the wrist locks in Aikido. There's a, a wrist lock called Nikyo, where it kind of bends the wrist and you can do it as a lock where it actually just kind of pushes someone to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our instructors did this to a student and she said, I don't feel anything and actually stood up and broke her own wrist. I was on the other side of the room and I could hear the snaps. It was just one of those. It's like, oh, and, <laughs> and the instructor is just sitting there looking at it because her arm's now bending in weird angles. He's like letting go of it, almost freaking out about it. So that's about the only good injury story I got for that. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. I've never heard of anybody breaking their own arm that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> good times. Well, gentlemen i really appreciate you being here it was a great conversation i had a lot of fun and listeners i hope you enjoyed this if this is something that you want to hear more of by all means please let us know whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so, guys thanks for coming on i'll talk to you soon hey thank awesome. you for having me i'll send you that link to the uh, fights perfect hey everyone i want to thank you for tuning in checking out this new sort of experimental format that we tried. What did you think? Did you like it? Did you enjoy the conversation? Are there other topics you want to see tackled in this way? If you're a regular listener to the show, you know that the Thursday episodes have generally been shorter. There's something that I've tackled on my own, except with one exception, now two. So really just kind of want to know what you want. This, is, this isn't just Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is your show. And it really means a lot to us that we get your feedback so we can build the best show for you, for our listeners, because that keeps you coming back and that helps us grow. You can check out the show notes as always, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links to the redneck jujitsu and the flaming sword guitar, sword, flaming guitar brick breaking videos and McDojo Life's social media and a bunch of other stuff. So that's over there, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's all for today, and you know how the end goes. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.